Hello, everyone. Thank you for being with us today. I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Uh, welcome to this week's History's Lunch program, which is sponsored by the John and Lucy Shackelford Charitable Fund of the Community Foundation for Mississippi. We're in the Craig H. Nielsen here in our homes, the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. And if you have not already done so, please silence your cell phones. I note with sadness the death of Robert Moses, whose influence in our state stretched across decades from his work registering black voters to his organization of the Mississippi Freedom Summer Project to his work in local schools here in Jackson with his algebra project. He's one of the most central figures of the Civil Rights Museum, and we were fortunate to have him deliver the 2014 Medgar Evers Lecture. Bob Moses' personal bravery, his commitment to justice, and his determination to help build a better country were unsurpassed. We have had a late change in our History is Lunch schedule. Bobby Rush was originally set for August 11th, but uh, some flight changes forced him to reschedule his program. I'm grateful that Christian Pennon and Charles, Week have, Charles Weeks have agreed to swap dates with him. So, will y'all be back to help Bobby as dancers next week? <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. So next week we will have Bobby Rush and Brenda Willis uh, <laughs> to talk about Bobby's new book, I Ain't Studying You, My American Blues Story. And if you think that won't be fun. Today, we're delighted to have Amy Evans and Martha Foos to present A Good Meal is Hard to Find Unless You Know Where to Look. Amy Cameron Evans is an award-winning artist, writer, and documentarian based in Houston, Texas. Evans built the documentary program at the Southern Foodways Alliance, where she served as their lead oral historian for more than a decade. Her paintings have appeared in Southern Living, Southern Cultures, and on CNN's Etocracy, and her writing has appeared in The Bitter Southerner, The Local Palette, and Cornbread Nation 5, The Best of Southern Food Writing. Martha Hall Foose's cookbook career began with Screen Doors and Sweet Tea, Recipes and Tales of a Southern Cook, which won the James Beard Award for American Cooking. Her follow-up, a southerly course, Recipes and Stories from Close to Home, found its way onto best of the best lists from NPR and Food and Wine. Foose co-authored My Two Souths, blending the flavors of India into a southern kitchen with Chef Asha Gomez, and last year, Martha received the Richard Wright Literary Excellence Award from the Natchez Literary and Cinema Celebration. Help me welcome Amy Evans and Martha Foose. Good morning. Turn your cook on. We Good. are sure glad to be here. Yes, thanks for the big turnout, and I'm glad to see everybody gets to have lunch today. That's coming. It's thinking. There we go. That's us. <laughs> Well, I guess we should start with how this project came together. I had bugged Amy about it for five years. A long while. <laughs> um, and so I'll let Amy tell the story of how she finally acquiesced to collaborate with me. Well, I have, I've known Martha. If y'all have looked at the book, I tell how we got to know each other. Um, I've known Martha for going on 20 years uh, as a friend we and met colleague. met toddlers. Yes, we were very young. Uh, but so I've known her for a good long while, and she's been familiar with my paintings and my artwork. And then fast forward, I'm, I lived in Oxford for 13 years, and then I moved back home to Houston uh, in 2014. And all I remember is being in the parking lot of our beloved uh, Texas grocery store, H-E-B, um, when Martha called and she said, Amy, and it was kind of out of the blue, but she said, Amy, you know, you're... Um, titles of your paintings would make really great recipe headnotes because I had for a long time been doing these portraits uh, of imaginary characters, mostly women, through these um, still lifes. So I got to a point where I was painting what I wanted to paint and then as I painted the story would come and I would think of this character and I do a lot of vintage packaging and things in my imagery and so um, there's a good example. Uh, <laughs> and so then as I painted, kind of a story would come up to me, like who would be this woman who would drink grapefruit juice and have a ruler nearby with a little sardine and a pedophore? Like that has got to be somebody I want to know. So I actually ended up naming this painting after my grandmother Marge, my um, father's mother. And she didn't drink except for if she had some vodka every time and again. That would be, that would be her thing. And she always had 
salmon every day and did the crossword every day, and she had a very regimented life for herself. And so this, the title of the painting is Marge Took Her Usual Measurements. And then so Martha's great idea was to elaborate on the backstory for the paintings. And, and what is not immediately obvious when you look at the book is that what happened is that Martha's recipes are inspired by my paintings. The paintings came first. And so her recipes really illustrate my paintings. And there are so about when you five or six ones that were created just for the book. Yes, because we had some holes to fill, so we yeah. had, to, had to make some extra. But, so Martha, I would love for you to tell the people how you did that, because I do a lot of paintings of vintage packaging, like cans of Crisco and cans of Texan and um, old vintage cans of Bisquick and pounds of butter. And so Martha's genius is that she... It was inspired to have that be? It, it was kind of a call and response type yeah. of relationship. Mm -hmm. So we, st the jumping off point was the stories behind Amy's paintings and their titles. And then I would come up with a recipe in response to the picture. So this one, i put my eyeballs in, um, is a cocktail called The Usual Sunrise. It, it includes uh, grapefruit juice, uh, the beloved uh, Jackson Honeysuckle of Vodka from Cathead Distillery. And um, do you want to read the head note? Sure. Marge had her usual breakfast, and then she took her usual measurements. For her, those unusual measurements included two fingers of flower-scented vodka and four inches of her beloved pink grapefruit juice. Marge's ex-sister-in-law opened her pantry, saw all the, rows, all the rows of Texan lined up neatly, and called her a creature of habit. That did not sit well with her. Why, just today, Marge added chili powder and salted the rim of her glass. That was most unusual. So, um, and throughout the book, we have these little um, asides that are called notes and notions. And some of those are really silly. And some of them are, you know, actual helpful cooking tips. And then some of them will be how to make certain ingredients so that uh, we use a lot of, I'm not too proud to say that I'm some sort of from scratch cook every day of the week because we all have, you know, actual lives. So we'll call out for a can of Bisquick, I mean a, bo a box of Bisquick or something like that if it's necessary. So this one also has a note on um, how to make your own honeysuckle blossom if you remember to do it during those brief week and a half of when the, the um, honeysuckle blooming. So that was kind of gives you an idea of how we... Um, kind of got into this collaboration and we had so much fun. I mean, basically we sat out at the farmhouse at Pluto and yes, I'm that girl from that Pluto book. Um, just want to clear that up. <laughs> they didn't ask me to be president of the PTA after that one came out. I can um, tell you for sure. Um, but we sat around the kitchen table out at the farmhouse and then around the kitchen table, which I call the kitchen bed at our house in Greenwood. And we just sort of filled in the life stories of a bunch of imaginary friends. And we've always been huge, huge fans of community cookbooks. And one thing that we really wanted to stress in working with this, the majority of the characters in this book are women because in a lot of community cookbooks, you'll see a recipe and it'll say, like the name of the recipe is um, like Mrs. Munson's cold tongue. And then at the end of the recipe, it won't even have that woman's first name. And it always kind of made me mad because you'd read all these old community cookbooks and it would be Mrs. J.R. Smith, nay, Snavely, but you still didn't know who this woman's first name was. So we really wanted to kind of give voice to a lot of these type of characters that we didn't really know anything about. Um, and then some of them were inspired by family. A lot of Martha's family's uh, names are in the book. And then this, this one happens to be my maternal grandmother, Grace. This one's about, but I was just going to tell a little bit about the process of the book too, because when we were writing our manuscript, um, we wanted to have like a, a potential cover for the book and what kind of our vision for how it would all come together as a package. And so I made this painting. This is a story from growing up. Uh, my mother is from Decatur, Alabama. And then my family moved to Houston, um, is, which is where I grew up, in Houston, Texas. And the story my mom always told is that my grandmother, Grace, came to visit and brought a ham in her little Samsonite 
a carry case, and my mother was so offended that she thought her mother was saying she couldn't feed her own family. And so I had always had that painting in my head, and I never did it. And then I was like, this is the time to do it. And so whenever I'd visit my grandmother Riley, I would fly uh, to Huntsville by myself, and then she'd put me back on a plane with a bunch of nabs to snack on in the plane on the ride home. And then the pattern on the bottom, I like to do fabric patterns as part of the composition to um, give it a, a balance between some organic and inorganic objects and elements within the painting, but also to kind of set it in a time period. And so I look at a lot of vintage fabrics and things, but this is that, it's actually dogwood in the painting, but it's inspired by that dusty rose china pattern that my grandmother had. Um, and so this, and this was a really fun recipe that Martha is my hero for putting this together, but I'll read the head note first and then you can talk about the recipe, okay? I love this head note. So the original painting title is Grace Couldn't Take Any Chances, so she fit all sorts of contingencies into her train case. This was, after all, the first time she was making the trip to visit her granddaughter all the way over in Texas. For all Grace knew, they ate brisket for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That just wouldn't do. No, ma'am. Grace made sure that they would have some proper Alabama staples within reach during her visit. She packed some nabs at the last minute just to make the trip bearable. And in trying to formulate a homemade nab recipe, first <laughs> of all, what kind of nutcase spends a week trying to crack the, ca the code of how to make nabs at home. Um, but apparently <laughs> it's <does>. me. Um, <laughs> and most of the recipes in the book are really straightforward, one-page type, easy-peasy recipes that you can do in a weeknight. The nabs, however, are a little more involved. Labor of love. They are a labor of love. They're absolutely delicious, but I'm just warning you, if you walk down this nab road, it's a few-step process that you involves making the dough, then letting the dough rest, and then rolling the dough out on a pasta machine, and folding the dough, and letting it rest, then rolling it out on a pasta machine, then cutting it out, then docking the holes in it, and then making the peanut butter filling. But the peanut butter filling is also really good on just like celery sticks. By or, itself. And, <laughs> and much as it breaks my heart, people say, oh, it's a Cheez-It. <laughs> That's what our publishers said about the nabs, is they thought that we had to set them straight. They're over in San Francisco, though, so they didn't really know anything. Yeah, they didn't know a lot. <laughs> but in, um, we really had to differentiate between a four-corner nab, which is obviously cheese with peanut butter, or a round nab. So whenever we in our family go to the, like, stop on a road trip, somebody like, oh, get some nabs, and then you say, round or four-corner. So this is for four-corner nabs. Um, in, in this one. So you can see how much fun we had. And as we were working on this, even people that, or some of the characters inspired by family members and stuff, it would get to be the point where we really felt like some of these women were just pulling up chairs at the dining room table and telling themselves, or telling us about themselves. And so we had an absolute ball putting this together. A lot of laughs. A lot of laughs. And I'll say, too, about the notions and notes that we have throughout the book that, you know, it's a nod to, like, a sewing kit, sewing notions and things women have tucked away that nobody can see or things they collect and material culture and stuff like that. And the, with the, when you did the recipe of the four-corner nabs, you used a little pastry wheel, but we were always, t I was always nagging on her about, you know, what if you use, like, a little, you know, sewing wheel, a little cutting, fabric cutting wheel to cut your four corner nabs or what if that a bunch of the paintings in the book um, are from a show I did in Houston about seven or eight years ago that was at the Kiehl's um, cosmetic shop they have the face creams and the lotions and stuff and so I had an exhibit of work there and it was all about Greece it was all about vintage beauty was the name of the of the exhibit and so I had a, a painting of Crisco and a painting of a jar of Duke's mayonnaise and a painting of Vaseline because um, I love the ideas of how those things have different uses. And that's kind of how we started talking with the sewing notions and with those kinds of ideas, like how to add another layer of story and another layer of information and kind of tips to the cookbook. And, and the objects in Amy's paintings are so spare that in a lot of the head notes, we wanted the story to be just as mysterious as some of her paintings are because we kind of like to leave it so you had to fill in some of the gaps of what did you think happened. So the book, I think, really functions as a storybook, 
and also as a collection of Amy's paintings, but then also a um, thing to make great snacks. So it's a, a trifecta. <laughs> and this uh, little visual reminder, um, you know, when Chris introduced me, I spent a lot of time traveling the South documenting Southern food culture for the Southern Foodways Alliance up at the University of Mississippi. And so over the years, you know, I had that day job, but I was still painting. And so, of course, a lot of that field work inspired some of my paintings. And so I have a couple paintings in here that are really inspired by some field work I did in Apalachicola, Florida. There's a can of salmon, um, and there's some oysters, and that kind of thing. Um, and then, of course, you know, I've done a lot of work in Mississippi, and I did a Delta Lebanese project for the Southern Foodways Alliance. And I had an intern who did a Delta Chinese project here, and then I did the field work for the Mississippi Delta Hot Tamale Trail ages ago. And so this is kind of a nod. There's some nods to some of those people I've met along the way, like Tommy Ward in Apalachicola. He and his family are mentioned in a head note. Um, and then Martha has this great recipe, um, Frank's Collard Green and Field Pea, uh, and field pea Fried Rice. Um, you want to talk about it? What page am I? It's 110, page 110. I'll read the head note while you're hunting. Frank had been a regular at the carnival for years, spending his money with the same crooked eye carny, bound and determined to win. But after so many failed attempts, playing against chance had become more of a habit than anything else. This time, though, he had a secret weapon, Lottie. They'd, been dating, they'd only been dating for a month, but he knew she was his good luck charm. He was right. Finally, Frank won a lion at the ring toss. Um... So this recipe, uh, if you've never been to the um, Delta Chinese Museum at Delta State, which it focuses a lot on Chinese grocery stores throughout the Delta, it's a wonderful stop and it's easy to get to on campus. And um, that brought back memories of, of hanging out there. And Amy and I are also a state sale hounds. I mean, I will go through that drunk, junk kitchen drawer in the gross, in the kitchen and pull out every type of napkin ring. We love all sorts of things like this. But I think this is an example of one of the recipes that's super easy. You can start with bacon grease, which <laughs> is, is my um, preference, but you can also use some sort of other oil, like peanut oil. Um, we're gonna use some grated fresh ginger, chili flakes, some chopped garlic, white onion, celery, and a can of field peas with snaps. Now, um, oh, what was his first name? Uh, Thomas that started Glory Foods. Oh, gosh. Well, well That's a question I can't. Uh, Thompson or Thomas? I don't know. Anyway, don't know. the man that started, you know, Glory canned um, peas, he said, now, I'm not saying that these turnip greens are going to be as good as your mama's on a Sunday dinner, but on a Tuesday, it's a good collard greens. The same thing can be said with these um, field peas. So you're just going to use a can of field peas with snaps, some cooked white rice, and if you're going to make rice one day, just make another ex cook another extra cup and put it in the fridge, and then you're ready to go with fried rice later on. Um, some soy sauce, sesame oil. You put some scrambled eggs in there and sesame seeds for garnish, and it's really, really delicious, but it's when... Um, kind of uh, two cooking styles sort of mesh the way they do all over American cooking. So, um, and we also wanted to give a shout out to a whole, like we gave a shout out to Cathead. Um, we give a little shout out that says, we like to use um, Two Brooks Farms, uh, Miss Mottie Bayou Bouquet Rice, which is a, a local grown, um, basmati style rice that's from Sumner, Mississippi. So we really wanted to, as much as we love to celebrate independent bookstores and museums, you know, to really give these small producers um, a little time in the spotlight. And I'm going to give a quick shout out to my friend Bobby Jo Moon, whom I interviewed and I wrote an article about him for Mississippi Folklife some years ago. And he's from Cleveland. His family had a store in Cleveland and he lives in Houston now. So he's my Houston Chinese Delta family. But anyway, we've been talking a lot this week because, and last, because I'm actually here in Mississippi. I'm at the end of my two-week run at um, Jack's Farm in Cleveland where Will Jacks is doing like an artist retreat uh, residency program. And so he was kind enough to let me come stay out there and be inspired and ride these Delta roads again. And so 
all these Mississippi stories have been flowing back this week. So anyway, um, all our people. Uh, so let's see what we have next. We have, oh, tamales, of course. So as I said, I did, we, we, uh, Martha, the paintings came first. I had like 55 paintings. There's 60 in the whole book. And I had 55 paintings ready to go for Martha to be inspired by and create these recipes. But then we had some holes to fill. And of course, we were like, we need some Delta tamales represented in this book. Like if we don't do anything else, we need to do that. And so Martha was up for the challenge and had this wonderful tamale ball recipe. Um, it's kind of a speed tamale. If you don't have time to do all the shucks and the rolling and everything, <laughs> this is a good alternative. And they're great for a, a party or a brunch. Um, and then, of course, Lenore Ann is cousin Leanne, um, who's related to Martha, and I claim her as my own um, friend for life, sister from another mother. Uh, and so the backstory for this one uh, is Lenore Ann carried at least three bags of empty Tupperware containers with her every time she visited Joe's White Front Cafe in Rosedale. Miss Barbara had her spoiled. She'd make Lenore Ann special order if she called at least two weeks ahead. But today, Lenore Ann was caught without any Delta hot tamales in her freezer, so she had to make do for another of Jenny's baby showers. Lenore Ann never threw a party without tamales on her table. And we had a book signing in Rosedale at Joe's White Front Cafe on Saturday, and it was so much fun. So much fun. Rosedale so fun. really turned out. So again, thank you all, Rosedale, if you're, <laughs> yes. if you're tuning in. Um, so uh, I have to put on my eyeballs again. I know, they go on and they go off. I might should just keep them on. Um, and then we give a shout out to a bunch of other hot tamale um, folks all over Mississippi. And they're little shortcuts. Like if you don't have all of these seasonings because you're going to need red pepper flakes, dried oregano, cumin, coriander, salt, chili powder. If you don't have time or the inclination, you can just get a package of taco seasoning and use that instead and pass them off at the party. And no one will be disappointed. They won't be exactly the way they're supposed to. But um, I love a shortcut. And you cook these down in... Um, in a combination of a can of beef consomme and um, bay leaves. And in this, I use a combination of ground sirloin and, and ground breakfast sausage. And the fat in the breakfast sausage really helps keep them moist. And um, I think you'll be a fan <laughs> of these. And I want to add quickly that one of um, the little notes that we have on the page um, talks about going and hunting up some Delta tamales on your own if you're so inspired. So I'll just read it verbatim. But if this recipe just gives you a craving for tamales, we recommend ordering some online from the Texas Tamale Company or Scott's Hot Tamales in Greenville, Mississippi. If and when you have a wild hair, take a drive through the Mississippi Delta where you will find a particular style of tamale that took root in this part of the South more than a century ago. Make sure to visit Joe's White Front Cafe on Main Street in Rosedale. And don't forget, it's BYOT. Bring your own Tupperware. If you want the juice, you've got to have something with a lid on it. Um, but then that reminds me to bring this up maybe a little early, but we have a companion um, book to our main book that's uh, Chronicle Books made us call it a journal, but it's a good meal, it's hard to find journal, a pocket book of notions and notes. And this is deceiving because there is so much, in, it's not just a blank book for your dreams by your bedside when you wake up in the morning. It has uh, ideas for road trips, it has... Um, a list of books that we love. It has a gift ideas. A place for you to write down when somebody says, oh, I just read this book, and then you don't jot it down, and then you can't remember what it is. So there's a section. Oh, that that's me? me. I think that's me. Was there a section? There's a section to um, put down where people have recommended books for you and suggestions of um, road trips and road trips that you want to plan and gift ideas and... A few recipes and, and some paintings. It's got a, just a smattering and, of and, everything and, you would ever want. And in the back, it is a pocket book because it has a pocket for you to put all your little clippings in. So this was a really fun, um, fun addition to the project because we were thinking about what are all the things that I end up writing on the back of a deposit slip and then losing it or on the back of a checkbook, or I pin it to the refrigerator and it falls behind, you know, falls down and falls under the refrigerator. There's like, who knows what's under my refrigerator. Or in the cookbook, because <laughs> we talk about that in the introduction too. Uh, Martha has a cookbook with a safe combination written in it. And my 
family being from Decatur, Alabama, Cotton Country Cooking from the Decatur Junior League is the cookbook Bible of that community. And so we have multiple copies, my mother and I, but my mother has my grandmother's copy and there's, you know, the dry cleaning list and um, somebody's birthday and all kinds of life notes jotted inside like the family Bible. So this could be your new family Bible. <laughs> on, a, on another community cookbook note, um, in the, I think it's the, Jackson Symphony League cookbook that Ms. Welty had written the preface for. I got to go through her cookbook collection and she had penciled in proofreader marks throughout the entire front after it had been printed because I guess <laughs> she just couldn't contain herself. But you know community cookbooks are so wonderful and such a treasure that I hope y'all all make sure yours are safe and sound. But the, um, one of the recipes in that in the Symphony League, it kind of had a violent name, Squash Eudora. <laughs> it's a combination of summer squash and chicken livers. And I've never made it, but I always found the title a little off-putting. Squash Eudora? Well, no. <laughs> never. Um, I put up the next slide, Martha, about the baby corn. Um, this, when people ask what my favorite recipe is in the book, it's this one. And of all the ones, I wouldn't have thought this is the one that she is so crazy about. I know. Well, it's just the whole package of it because, and this is really, it really illustrates this collaboration and how much fun it was because I've been sitting on this painting of a can of baby corn because I love that label and I love this little painting. And then when we're talking about the cookbook, Martha says, oh, of course, you're going to fry that up and serve it with comeback sauce. And so <laughs> when we were um, testing recipes, and by that I mean when Martha was making them and I was eating them, uh, this was the most fun to eat also because, you know, she fries it, puts it out on a little paper grocery bag. It's hot. You dip it in the curry comeback sauce. It is so delicious. And so this was just such a surprise to me that a can of baby corn could inspire Martha and it would end up being this really fun, inventive, delicious thing. So this is always my and, answer. And for, for you comeback sauce purists, I'm just going to make <laughs> a few asides here. Now this is a curry comeback sauce, so it's not your straight up one you're going to eat with a sleeve of crackers, although it is good with a sleeve of crackers. But it's got yogurt and, um, you know, Heinz red chili sauce in it and um, really finely chopped um, white onion, curry powder, and some Kashmiri chili powder. And when I was working on um, My Two Souths about the Indian cooking, and then I also did another book with the same chef called I Cook in Color, I really became a fan of Kashmiri chili powder. And it doesn't have a huge amount of heat. It's got almost a fruity, um, fruity pepper flavor to it. So although it is not your typical comeback, you will come back for it. So, <laughs> And I'll take a second to read the headnote because it's one of my favorite headnotes too. Esther had a midnight snack. She felt compelled to stay up and pick apart the night's conversation. A can of baby corn was all she could find and it had been on the shelf for a while. Esther held on to it because her mother loved seeing it in her green salad along with a generous dollop of comeback dressing. She'd make do and she'd try to work through her frustration by morning. Esther. Uh, one of our imaginary one friends. One of our imaginary <laughs> friends. Yes, you know, we had to, in the front of the book, we had to put that disclaimer, any resemblance to persons living or dead is a pure coincidence. Because, <laughs> you know, somebody knows somebody in here, I feel sure. One or two people. Um, and that reminds me, too, somehow, the, the corn, about our little conversation with Chronicle about the cover of our book, which is a story I like to tell, because... Um, they didn't really know what to do with it. They didn't know what to do. And plus, you know, our sweet designer who did such a beautiful job, but, you know, she had the task of working with an artist who really has definite ideas about things. Um, but she did such a good job. But anyway, when we we're going over the cover, she had all these designs and we're like, no, not feeling it. Yeah. And so I said, well, let me just mock up a few ideas because I had kind of an idea of what I wanted to see. And so one of the mock-ups had that pink foam roller Instead of the rabbit's foot that's on the cover, it had a pink foam roller. And so they came back, they thought on it for a few days, and they came back, 
And it turns out we established a new rule at Chronicle Books that no hair-related products can appear no on the hair cover of a cookbook. <laughs> no hair products. And so, and then they didn't like this one either because they thought the nab was a cheese it. They didn't think that the rabbit's foot keychain was very appetizing. But then after we went back and forth long enough, they finally said, "Okay, this this one will do." So, and I love it. I love the the cover a lot. And then of course with this nice oil cloth on the side that appears in a bunch of my paintings. What's next? Oh, this is, last week this was Martha's favorite recipe in the book. That may have changed because it sometimes it changes. It depends on what's in the pantry and what's in my refrigerator and these days what's on sale. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, this painting with the cornmeal and oyster, you know, I, the easy thing to go to would have been fried oysters or fried oyster po' boy or something like that. But I kind of wanted to go a little deeper. And so what this is is a spoon bread. And are y'all all familiar with what spoon bread is? Kind of a poofy cornmeal um, cafe, uh, cafe, souffle. And this one also includes, um, a, you make a... Um, topping to go with the spoon bread that's got uh, sautéed artichoke hearts and oysters that's um, flavored with just simple little parsley, shallot, thyme, and um, it's a really good one for brunches. It's a really great one because you can make the spoon bread, put all the ingredients together ahead of time so when your company comes all you've got to do is, you know, how quickly oysters cook and just to sauté those off. Um, and there's some little um, notes about you can serve this oyster stew that you make to, to put on top with rice grits. And you can, um, it has little instructions over here in the corner about purchasing oysters, what to look for, what the sizes mean on the labels and that kind of thing. So hopefully it's um, just got some good general information aside from stories of hijinks. Um, in the head note, I'll read. Eula May was jotting down ideas for what to serve at Sunday's special occasion brunch. Things that go with oysters. Cornmeal. Perfect, she thought. Johnny could set out on his oyster skiff a time or two before everyone got to town, and Big Daddy was bringing his fryer, so supper was taken care of. And Eula May, this happens to be another real person from my family. This is my great aunt, uh, my grandmother Grace Riley's sister from North Alabama, and she has passed on because I would be in real trouble if she know that if she knew that I used her <laughs> given name Eula May in this book because she went by Mary her whole life. Um, Eula May, she did not want to carry with her out of North Alabama. Um, so yes, so I love that recipe too. That's a fun one, um, but maybe not as fun. I think the last one we have coming up. Oh no, there's one before it. So this painting is. The most famous painting. The most popular painting I have ever done. Um, How many prints of that? Oh my seen? gosh. So I'm sold out of the 11 by 14 prints of this painting. But this has been in the Bitter Southerner and Southern Living. People love this painting because you know how people are about their Duke's mayonnaise, especially this time of year. I think I've sold all my Duke's prints during the tomato growing month. Remind me to get back to mayonnaise. Okay. And so... Um, of course, this painting is in the book. There's another Duke's vintage jar of Duke's elsewhere in the book uh, that goes with some squash blossoms. And they sent really us lovely. a great box of Duke's swag. We've got they Duke's Turvis tumblers. We've got T-shirts now. So that, that yes. was a good move on our part. I know. We made good friends with and the Duke's And this people. headnote was kind of inspired by my next-door neighbor, um, whose actually name was Miss um, Riley Cole. And she, well into her 90s, was the bridge champion of Greenwood. And it just was a brilliant mathematical mind. But every week in the newspaper, first place, Riley Cole. Um, <laughs> and when she uh, passed away, I was helping her daughter, Lynn, clean out the kitchen. And there were all sorts of those little bridge tally books and things written again on, like, the back of a checkbook and that sort of thing. So... Um, do you want to read this one? Sure. So the, the original title of the painting, it doesn't happen every time in the book, but it, more often than not, it's the first sentence of the headnote, which is true here. 
Camille's grandmother loved Duke's mayonnaise and costume jewelry. Given the right crowd, she could pass them both off as the real thing. She was quite a hand at duplicate bridge, although she preferred rubber. When Camille was cleaning out the kitchen drawers in preparation for the dreaded estate sale, she found one of her grandmother's old scorecards with overtrick points and slam bonuses charted on one side and an egg salad recipe on the back. And so um, I get this question a lot about how to cook eggs if you want to make hard-boiled eggs. So there's extensive information on how to <laughs> steam your eggs and make them easy to peel. Um, and then there's little, you know, if you're doing entertaining tips, you know, to make them on part, make little sandwiches on party rye bread, and then put a little dot of mayonnaise on top, and then a little leaf of parsley on top of each sandwich, so you're extra cute. Um, but in the beginning of our book, there's sort of three introductions, one from Amy, one from me, then one from sort of us together, but with Amy. And then we decided that the majority of this community of women that are in this cook is a community practically bound by mayonnaise. And so we have a simple, simple recipe. I mean, seriously, you can make this mayonnaise in less than two minutes. So there's a simple um, way to make it if you have an immersion blender. There's instructions if you want to do it, a food processor or a blender. Or is, if I'm feeling energetic, I have one of those old Wesson mayonnaise, oh, mayonnaise makers where you have to pump it up and down. So we cover all these methods in, um, in the beginning. So if you want to uh, go on with the homemade mayonnaise, we've got you covered. And she made the homemade mayonnaise live on Zoom last <laughs> week under pressure of a virtual audience. And uh, it went over like gangbusters. We were both in Mar Martha's Kitchen for this virtual, virtual event for Brazos Bookstore in Houston. And it was so fun. We told stories, and she made a few things from the book. It was really great. OK, so this is the, this is the painting that I've been waiting on. Uh, a, vintage, a vintage bra box because uh, I will tell you before we tell you about the recipe and the head note and the painting is that I, in addition to being an artist and document, documentarian in Houston, I'm a teaching writer with Writers in the Schools, which is a nonprofit that takes professional writers into schools around the city. And I work primarily, it turns out, with elementary age students, uh, third and fourth grade. That is my lane. I love that age. And uh, I wanted to use the book as a, a teaching tool and have some of these be writing prompts, some of the head notes be writing prompts for the paintings for some of my students. And as I was looking for ones to use, I was like, huh, <laughs> this, is a, this cookbook is a little racy. There are a lot of women who are staying at, out late at night and coming home in the same clothes. And <laughs> yeah, we've got, we've got secret trysts going secret on. Secret trysts going on. But so... Um, there's one recipe for a key lime pie milkshake that is my go-to with my kids, and I always share the recipe with them for them to go home with their parents and make it at home. So I did, I did land on a successful one for the young people. But this one, this bra box, was really fun to make. And, then, and this was one of the later ones we did because I made this painting for the book. Um, I guess we needed something sweet to fill in a place. Um, yeah, and I just love those... Um meringue coconut fingers you know that you pipe out and sprinkle t uh, meringue on top of them and then you let them dry out in the oven and they keep forever and they're a great thing to bring to parties and I always like to have them around handy around Easter time and so and also you end up with some egg yolks left over at some other recipe so I had a bunch of egg whites that I needed to mm. find out what to do with so you want to tell yes me so the head note is Lessie twist tied her wedding, ring, her wedding rings to her bra strap. She learned her lesson the last time she made meringue. Lessie separated the eggs over the sink and, while cradling a yolk in her hand, both rings just slipped right off. She ended up wasting half a day with her head up under the, her least favorite cabinet working to fish them out of the drain trap. She couldn't let that happen again. And oddly, the twist tie reminds me of Hicks hot tamales in Clarksdale because they would tie their bundles of tamales with those little bread ties. <laughs> and people are intimidated by meringues, but they're really super easy. And I always like to make things that are super easy, but give the impression that you've really worked really hard on. Um, so this is a great one to take to parties. And they're great at Christmas time to dip one end, you know, in chocolate and sprinkles. And 
don't be intimidated by meringues. My mother, somehow during the pandemic, has decided that she's going to cook. Now, she teaches for the National Needle Art Sewing Guild and is a world-renowned sewing teacher. And I don't sew, and she didn't cook. So we did not get on each other's turf, and we have a great relationship. <laughs> well, this pandemic cooking has kind of had a little fruit basket turnover of, <laughs> of our relationship. And she started um, cooking all the time. And um, my husband loves lemon meringue pie. And every time, and I didn't want to be ugly, but she would make a weepy meringue. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about? I'm kind of saying it looks off the side. Um, so finally, she was like, now she'd call, you know, five times in the process of making these meringue, like making the meringue for the top of a pie. Well, now what do I do? It's like, Mama, I have got meringue recipes in four books. I used the same method in all four books. Now, would you just follow what I said? Well, darn if she didn't bring over a lemon meringue pie the other day with the perfect meringue. It was not weepy. So, um, trust me on this meringue situation. Here. <laughs> she finally listened. <laughs> she finally listened. Um, and so I'm thinking too, all of a sudden about, I don't know if this, any of y'all, if this is your first interaction with the idea of this book or seeing it in person or what, but it actually came out last year, about two weeks after COVID came out. <laughs> And so we were all excited about this book tour we and had getting like together. We had 40 places we, lined up, we everything had so from many South plans. Carolina down to Florida, you know, all over the country, events all over Texas. And so y'all are only like the third group of people we've gotten to yes, share it so with. we're finally <laughs> so in the same room so together. Much. But I also wanted to say that when it did come out a year ago, that it was really sweet the way people were interacting with it because everybody was at home. So everybody was cooking and everybody was taking time to read and everybody was taking time to post it on Instagram or whether, whatever. So we got so many stories about how people were enjoying the book. And one of my favorites, I don't even remember who it was, but it was a married couple where they would sit in bed together at night and the last thing they would do is read a couple of head notes from the book. So you never know when and where this will come in handy. And a lot of people are just so instagrammed out or any of those things where they think unless they have a picture of what the final recipe mm -hmm. is going to turn out to look like that it's going to be impossible to cook it well i think we can go back to those community cookbooks and know that every book did not have a picture of every single recipe in it and for a while i was closet doughboy at pillsbury i wrote the cookbook setter the checkout stand those little paperback ones, which my poor husband, I'd get a title, I'd have to do like casseroles. So I'd have to come up with 50 casserole recipes, which is a lot <laughs> of casseroles. And then in those little books, you have a picture of every recipe. And I think that was part of the training of the, in the 80s of how people started slowly having this idea that unless there's a picture, well, just like we want you to interpret these stories, you know, I try my best as a recipe developer to tell you what you need to do. And in this book, we really try to make it personal so that, you, we, you know, we're going to tell you to use your pan and then this is your eggs. And they'll tell you step by step and give you little hints because we want everybody to have a successful experience with the recipe. But just because you don't have a picture of it staring you in the face doesn't mean that you shouldn't go ahead and try the recipe. You know, take a leap of faith and, and interpret it in your own way. And, and on, feel free to have a strong and, drink nearby to get you through it all. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then do you want to just the next yeah, one? Yeah, so the next one's the journal. So um, this came out a little bit after the book, but we're just so pleased with it that we um, love telling everybody about it. It's a really fun companion piece. And it, I... And then also, if you go to um, our website, uh, goodmealishardtofind.com, um, there are photos where people have made the recipe at home. I mean, we have a little um, There's an Instagram employment. account for, for the book. Mm -hmm. We have a little thing that we implore you in the end to take pictures of the recipes once you make them and send them to us so other people can see how you might have garnished them or what you used it for or what event you used it for. So that's been a really fun thing to keep in contact with all the readers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because everybody has a story of their own inspired by the stories in here. So that's been really fun. 
But we would love to hear your stories and questions with our remaining time. And if anybody has a question, you may raise your hand and a microphone will come running to you. Whisk. Whisk to you. Whisk to you. If not, <laughs> we actually have the fixings for homemade mayonnaise in this case, and Martha can... <laughs> This is, this is the secret ingredient. That's why there's a lock. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Questions over here? Yes, what is your very favorite recipe that you make? Um, see, that's a tough one because it depends. In the wintertime, it might be the, um, is it Fanny's oxtails? That's kind of like a French onion soup made with oxtails and melted cheese on the top of it. And that's what I might love in November or January, but as hot as it is today, that's not going to be my favorite recipe today. Today my favorite recipe might be the um, seafood cocktail over the red ice that we were talking about <coughs> earlier. I've been having a taste for that, that one, since we were talking about it. Or this one is... Um, We've got several alcoholic and non-alcoholic drinks in here, but this is a lemon lavender float where you use uh, lemon lavender lemonade, and then it has a scoop of lemon sorbet in it, and it's super refreshing. And so that might be my one on a hot afternoon. So it, it varies time of year. And again, um, whatever I don't have to go to the store and get. Duke's Mayonnaise was started in Greenville, South Carolina, and in the downtown area, the walking area in downtown Greenville, there is a bridge named the Duke Bridge, <laughs> and I have been there. Well, how about that? We were walking across this bridge, and of course it meant nothing to me, but when she got it, she almost jumped up and down and said, I know Duke's Mayonnaise, I know Duke's Mayonnaise. <laughs> now, I must say, I was raised on either homemade or Hellman's, but my mother was a blue paint baby. So we have some scattered mayonnaise affiliations in our family. So, And I'm not sure you said this either, either but the homemade mayonnaise recipe that's in the beginning of the book we call Duchess's Mayonnaise. Yeah. So it's the Duchess for the Duke, <laughs> since it's all our lady friends. Uh, several years ago, the Wall Street Journal had an insert that was all about cooking with mayonnaise. Cakes, uh, grilling with your steaks, et cetera, et cetera. It's remarkable. Yes, it is. It's a magical <laughs> ingredient. You have to be applauded for bringing Richard Grant into Mississippi. Where is he now? I haven't heard of him. He is um, living in Tucson. His mother's, his mother, his wife's mother uh, lives out there and they moved back for them to sort of um, help in her caregiving. And he is writing for the Smithsonian. So if you get a, a subscription to Smithsonian Magazine, you'll be able to see a lot of his articles. And he's got a great article that's in a, a issue from several years ago that if you're a Jackson person, you might want to check out where he takes a, um, a road trip with the Jackson State um, dance team to Las Vegas. <laughs> and um, if you're a fan of his writings, you might want to check that one out because it's, it's really a good one. And he said one of the sweetest things about the book when he, he read did. it. Um, he did. He was really taken with it and, and loved it. And I, I was really amazed at how much he really got into it and just I was talking to him I don't know it was back maybe in the spring and he's like those little vignettes and stories still stay with me and sometimes if I see one of the ingredients that's featured in the painting I immediately go back and think about the story that goes with it so I, we were both really touched that mm -hmm. he that he felt that way any more questions burning questions I'm sure there'll be more questions but I have one yes. talking about your mother, Martha, taking up cooking during this time. You're both mothers. Are your children at all interested in spending time in the kitchen with you or working no. with you? Yeah, yeah no. When my son was little and we had a bakery, he loved it because it was, you know, massive amounts of dough, like 40 quarts worth of dough at a time, and he could wrestle it and punch it, and, you know, that was all exciting. There were big machines, but, no, nah, he's, not, he's not interested in 
he's going up to Mississippi State this year, and his roommate's family has My Little China in Greenwood, which is a great restaurant. So his father's a chef, and so our two kids are pretty used to eating pretty well. Um, so we're not sure how they're going to manage dorm life um, <laughs> and, and the struggles of, of uh, microwaved food for the... Sophia's got dorm life down, and she's not even 12 yet, but she loves some ramen. <laughs> and she, that, that's what she cooks. She loves to bake, too, but if she's going to make a snack, it's a ramen snack. And if y'all have any general cooking conundrums, I'm happy to give you my two cents on <laughs> We asked on the Zoom thing the other day, I said, Martha, what do you have to tell people who are scared of their mayonnaise breaking? And she said, read my recipe. <laughs> <laughs> Follow my recipe. <laughs> um, some of the other ones that I'm a big fan of, one of them has another Jackson connection is, uh, this is a funny one. Do you want to read this head note? We have time. Maybe. Um, what page is it? For Arturo's Waffles. This is, one, oh, yes. this is one of my fave recipes in here. And it is a takeoff <clears throat> on a recipe, a waffle recipe that I'd found in an old community cookbook. And I just wanted to update the method a little bit because I like a crispy waffle. So um, I'll read the head note, but if I may share two quick stories about <coughs> this, this painting, which Ellen Bordeaux. Years ago, I had this show here in Jackson, Eudora's Eurythmia, I think, and I, I did a painting for the show, and it was this. And then I had this painting for sale at uh, Amelia in Oxford, a little gift boutique, and some late night on the square, some frat boys broke the window and damaged my painting, and they had to pay for it. I was so tickled. <laughs> so anyway... And then that, and then the frat boy ended up sending it back to me. He's like, it doesn't really go with my stuff, so you can have it back <laughs> anyway. <laughs> the thing. And it's a long story. When we say storied <laughs> recipes, we mean storied we recipes. We mean storied recipes. So anyway, um, it was inspired by uh, Missy Dora's children's book, The Shoe Bird. And so the... Um, Head note is, Arturo oh, took a break from the Sunday crossword to make breakfast. As he buttered his waffle, he, pu buttered his waffle, he puzzled over the answer for 24 down, a six-letter word for a type of root or meal. The meanings of words are serious things, you know, Arturo said. After talking all day, he was thirsty for buttermilk. Eudor Welty, the Shebird, 1964. And so these are waffles that you can put together all of the dry ingredients and put all the wet ingredients together in the refrigerator and then in the morning, all you have to do is dump them together. But they have, um, they're made with buttermilk and poppy seeds folded into the waffles. And then you slather them with butter that's been mixed with plum jelly. They're good. They're very good. And would anybody like to take a gander at the six-letter word for a type of root or meal? Because we have the answer in our notions and notes. But if anybody would like to, to try that one. Any, any guesses? The six-letter word for a type of root or meal is square. And so this is one of the ones I use for my fourth graders. <laughs> and they love it because they love a riddle. I guess that's it. Okay, any other questions? I mean, you may as well take advantage of Martha's deep knowledge of recipes. If not, thank you all for coming. We have copies of the book uh, at a special History is Lunch price, $20 today. It's a... It's an excellent work, and uh, if you do want to ask either of these speakers anything, they will be in line over here in just a few. Thank you all for coming today. Come back next week. Uh, we'll have a dance line for Bobby Rush. <laughs> Help me thank Amy Evans and Martha Foos for this talk. Now, Martha, we can say we...